It was 2015 when I came across this TV show called as Sherlock. In the show, we follow a detective who is extremely brilliant and a master of deduction. But there was one person who was always one step ahead of Sherlock, Charles Augustus Magnuson. In the show, he is claimed to have data points on all the high tier population of the country. It's a mystery where he keeps all his data, which he has access to at all times. While Sherlock searches Charles' mansion, he finds no evidence of any servers or any data books of any kind. And then, Charles mentions that all his information is present inside a castle, which is in his mind, a memory castle. And ever since I watched that episode while being a fascinated kid, I always wondered what are the ways in which we can learn a lot of information and store it in our brains at once. Hi everyone, my name is Anuj. I am now a third year MBBS student. Thanks a lot. I know you're cheering for me. So I have a quick exercise for all of you guys watching. Here's a list of items that I want you to memorize right now. You can pause the video if you want more time, but don't take more than one minute. Alright, now I need you to write down all the items that I just showed you in a piece of paper or try naming them verbally. So I showed you 10 items, out of that how many items were you able to name? Most people at this time get around 50 to 80% of the items correct, but very few people get 100% of the items correct. Alright, now look at this image and I want you to look at all the different items that are present in this image. You can pause the video if you want to take more time, but again, don't take more than one minute. Now I want you to name all the items that you saw in that image right now. This time it was not about how many items can you name, but how quickly can you name them, because you remembered almost all of them. In fact, most people watching this video remember around eight to nine items from that image. Right, so what does these two results show you? And how is it related to me learning so many books for my MBS examinations? Well, the thing it shows us is that we are visual learners. Before language was even a thing, our brains adapted to what they saw. If they saw a mushroom which is poisoning their friends, they would stay away from that mushroom. And if they saw sweet berries which were delicious to eat, they used to gather that. It was not based upon what you are reading or writing, but it was based upon what you are seeing. Hence, the visual portion of our brain is much more evolved in terms of remembering the complex details. In fact, our ancestors remembered entire parts Paths which they had walked on so that they could come back home after a hard day of hunting and gathering. So again, what does this tell you practically? How is this related to you doing your second year examinations? The point that I was trying to make is that learning is not necessarily based on active recall and spaced repetition, but still can last a very long duration of time. So our theory books are divided into two parts, the concepts as well as the facts. And we have got a lot of facts that we just need to keep in our minds and we need those facts spontaneously. Let's say that I'm walking down the street and a person collapses in front of me having generalized tonic-clonic seizures. I need to remember what is the drug required and what is the dose that I need to give to this person to save his life. And if not that drug, then which other drugs? Similarly, there are various other instances in which the facts that we have read in the textbooks are directly used as practical knowledge in our clinics. How do I do it? First of all, using images. Let's take an example of a bacteria who has spores. Now there are numerous bacteria who have spores. The location and the size of the spores tell us which bacteria they are. Learning this factual information is very difficult, yet it is very important because these bacteria are kept as spottings in our examinations. And one of these bacteria, Clostridium tetani, was our spot in our microbiology exam. So how does our visual memory develop from our ancestral age come to us at this point? Instead of memorizing what theoretically these bacteria look like, I looked up the images of what these bacteria actually look like. So I would have a much more visual representation. So whenever I saw a drumstick appearance, I would know that it is Clostridium tetani. If you're a student outside the medical field, you can apply that in your day to day life as well. Because I'm sure memorization comes in almost every single field that you have to go to. This is a sample of my notes that I used to study for my university examinations. As you can see, it has got a lot of different diagrams. Each segment of this diagram represents a particular thing and that is how I remembered a lot of things at the same time while also not have to read it every single day over and over again. Alright, moving on to our second exercise, here's a list of all the different bacteria that cause tuberculosis. It is called as a Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex and it is one of the important questions that we are asked in our vivas. I give you one minute to remember all the names which are shown in the screen right now. You can pause the video if you want to. Even if you are a non-medical student, give this a try because the medical student who reads it for the first time is basically just like you. He has never read it in the first place and he doesn't know what these names mean anyway. So just give it a try. Cool. Can you name the bacteria which I was just showing in the screen? If you can, then it's awesome you've studied this chapter. But if you can't, then welcome to second year. A year in which you will forget more than you have read. Alright, so now I'm gonna make your life easier and tell you how I memorized all of these bacteria in under one minute and I didn't even have to revise it over and over again. Here we go. Imagine Mycobacterium tuberculosis sitting on a cow. Cow means bovis, right? Then these two guys, the cow and the mycobacterium, go towards Khapri. Khapri is a place located near Nagpur. After Khapri, they go to South Africa because they are on a world tour, right? In Africa, they meet Mickey Mouse, which is their favorite character, of course. And Mickey Mouse offers them Pani Puri, which they eat. So let's just quickly revise what happened. 
Mycobacterium tuberculosis sat on a cow and they went to Khapri. After Khapri, they went to Africa. They met Mickey Mouse and Mickey Mouse gave them Pani Puri. After eating the Pani Puri, the Mycobacterium's ear fell off. The kaan tha uska, wo gir gaya niche. So what does this mean anyway? This, this is a story and I want you to realize how powerful the story is. Mycobacterium tuberculosis sat on bovis. Tuberculosis bovis. They went to Khapri, which basically means Capri. Then they went to Africa, Africanum. Then they met Mickey Mouse, which is basically Microti. Then Pini Pedi for Pani Puri. And finally, Keneti. That means Kaan Girgya. Keneti. Just by remembering this one short story of how a mycobacterium tuberculosis went all the way to Africa to eat Pani Puri with Mickey Mouse can make you remember these complicated names. I'm gonna give you one more example of how I use this to memorize the different drugs. So we have third generation cephalosporins, a classic, which a lot of people get stuck on. So here's how I learned it. I was having a sore throat, so I took the Ziffy tablet. That tablet got absorbed into my blood and it went to my kidneys to be excreted. In the kidneys, it met a podocyte, which is a cell present over there. And both of them took a taxi to go to Delhi. In Delhi, these both guys met a guy with three axes. Due to all of this traveling, Mr. Ziffy was feeling not so well. So he took a paracetamol and then the podocyte was very ziddi that he wanted to buy a particular sweater from Delhi. So this is a story that I used to learn all the third generation cephalosporins and this was asked as one of the MCQs in our final examination. Here's an explanation of what this means. I took Ziffy tablet. Ziffy, the content is Ziffexin, which is overall third generation cephalosporin used for sore throat. That's how I remembered it. When I ate that, it went to my podocytes. So it is Cif podoxime. Then they took a taxi, which was Cephotaxin. They went to Delhi, Cef Denir. They met a guy with three axes, Cef Pragzon which gave them a paracetamol tablet, Cephoparazone, and finally the podoxime was very siddhi, Ceftazidine. So these are the third generation cephalosporins that you have memorized just now with me. It does not matter if you're a medical student or not. This is the power of storytelling. And I've used this storytelling technique in almost all the subjects that I've studied. This reduces my time for space repetition by a lot because even if I just read it once before the examination, everything will come back to me. I don't have to rewrite it again and learn it again, which saves me a lot of time to make awesome YouTube videos like this. By the way, if you're enjoying it and if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. So a lot of you guys might be thinking that these are just mnemonics, but my friends, mnemonics are very different because why? You can easily forget what the mnemonics actually mean and you can forget the mnemonics themselves. These are stories and stories are permanently engraved in our brains because our brain was built to remember stories and that is the reason why you still remember Avengers Infinity War back from the day that you first saw it and don't remember what you studied early in the morning today. Moving on to our second last technique, here I'm going to talk about tables. So in microbiology we have a lot of different pathogens to study and each one of them can be super confusing. I'm sure if you're a non-medical student you have some subjects like this which have so many, so many facts that you are definitely bound to get confused. Confused. At that time, make the use of tables because then your mind knows a visual way of representing that information. Even though you can't form an image out of it, a table is something which brings you much closer to that visual memory which I was speaking about a bit earlier. Apart from these factual information that we have to learn in MBBS, there's a lot, a lot of concepts that we also have to memorize, learn and use in practical life. How do we learn these concepts? First of all, by actually going to the clinics and performing these experiments ourselves. You could read all about how to take a pulse, but unless and until you don't practice it, it's not worth it. But sometimes the facts are not as practical as taking a pulse or taking the blood pressure but more of internal mechanisms of the body for example the renin angiotensin mechanism or how a certain drug acts for these i used a lot of flowcharts and a lot of diagrams which are given in standard text and also you can make some of your own flowcharts etc this makes you keep all the information again in a visual manner and that is what gives you more marks in the examination also if you are making flowcharts that's going to be super helpful moving on to the last part which i personally have not tried so far but i'm very excited to do that in third year this is called as the memory castle which Charles Augustus Magnuson was talking about in the Sherlock's episode. Basically, what you have to do is that you have to visualize a familiar environment that may be your home, that may be your hostel room, or that may be any place that you love. It could also be your Minecraft base for that matter. And now every single time that you want to memorize something, you just imagine yourself virtually in this room. Place the facts, place the images, place the concepts on different places. For example, I could keep the Mycobacterium tuberculosis complex entire image on this table. I could imagine what the different bacterial spores look like by drawing them on the wall. The more creative you get with this, the better it is that you will remember it. And the next time you want to recall those facts, just go inside your mind castle and think what is kept in this table, what is drawn on that wall, and those should come back to you. I am going to be honest with you, I have not tried it, but I have heard that it is super effective, hence it is worth mentioning over here. 
However, if you do end up making one, please do let me know down below by commenting. Apart from all of that, limiting the content that you want to study for the examination, repeating the answers and the questions that are going to be coming in the examinations, and discussing with your friends is all the other different things which I used to memorize all the different subjects together, and hopefully they will give me good marks after the result is out. So is active recall and spaced repetition still a thing? Of course, it is still very good, but the only downside is that you cannot apply it for very large subjects. For example, if you have seven subjects, you cannot do an active recall for all of that, that seven subjects altogether, right? You'll be in the need of some things which are going to reduce your time in that recall, in that repetition phase. And the sooner and sooner you move on to reading it once and learning it using all of these techniques which I talked about is going to be saving you a lot of time in the future. Anyways, I have two requests for you after watching this video. First of all, if you haven't subscribed already, please consider doing so because making videos such as this take a lot of time, effort and energy and subscribing by just two seconds makes up for all of that. Apart from that, you can always change your mind later. Request two is please share this video with your best friend so that they also could gain the same amount of value that you just did. Anyways, thanks a lot for watching. It's me Anuj and I will catch you in the next one. Bye.